Okay. So, okay, welcome back to the to the second hour. Um, where we stopped before the break was uh, when we wrote down this expression for um, for the pressure. We had um, the first one for uh, for R being lower than A, and then the second one for R being larger than A. So we have now an expression for the pressure throughout the whole the whole vortex. And now, of course, we would like to uh, to sketch this. And what I do here, so I have a, as a function of R, I would like to show um, the pressure. Now, if you look at this, um, we can see that we have actually, in both cases, we have this um, this rho G Z and, um, and, and P zero, which is not the function of R. So that's just a function of Z. So that means what I would actually like to, to, to plot here is not P, but P minus, minus rho g z plus p zero. So essentially I remove I remove that part that is not proportional to R. Okay. So what then what do I have? If I start now, so if I if I say for instance that this here would now be R being A, so if I start now with the inner part, well if I start with zero R being zero, I see that this term becomes zero. So I have zero minus rho g z plus p zero. So that means that my first point that I can draw is actually is actually this value here. So this would be uh, the pressure. Uh, this would be zero. And then I see that the pressure then increases as a function of R squared up to this R being A. This this would probably look like like this, something like that. So this is proportional to R squared. And then after um, after R squared, I will go to the second equation. And there I see that um, actually the continuation is proportional to R up to minus two. And actually the the, the final value. So if, if R is going to be in to, to, to a large value, this one will become zero. These two we have already neglected. So it's actually this value that it would reach at R being very large. So from this point, from this point on, we kind of go like this. This is then proportional to one over R squared. And the, the asymptotic value that you would reach is the value of this one here, which is rho omega squared a squared. So that means that the, the delta p, so the, the pressure difference that, the, that a, a Rankine vortex can achieve is actually given by this green, um, the, this green circled term here, rho omega squared a squared. But let's just write that down um, um, more explicitly. So this pressure difference, um, delta P, you can calculate, calculate that from P um, of R set evaluated to R being zero, which is minus rho G Z plus P zero, and the limit of P of R comma Z for R going towards infinity, where we get as the value minus rho G Z plus P zero plus rho omega squared A squared. And of course, this means uh, essentially what we, just, uh, what we just said, that the delta P, the pressure difference that a Rankine vortex can achieve is rho times omega squared times a squared. That, of course, is exactly this difference that we that we have here from the value of zero to the the value at um, at infinity. So that means for a given for a given uh, speed and a given diameter of the vortex, we can calculate how much under pressure I will have in the vortex center. 
And of course, now we can also see what we had in the, in the poll in the beginning, namely that the pressure is actually lowest in the center of the vortex. It's lower by delta P than, than um, in the surroundings. So that is really the conclusion here, the lowest pressure um, is in the center of the vortex as what we as what we said and i guess now i would like to just show you uh, some examples of of um, of um, uh, of, um, of vortices and one example of course is um, you know storms tornadoes for instance where you have kind of uh, uh, vortex um, swirling around and also there you have the lowest pressure in the center. And then uh, during the break I was um, showing two other examples. One is this vortex cannon when you have a, a box filled with uh, smoke and then a hit on it and then you will get a, a vortex kind of coming out of this box, a vortex ring coming out of it which is then kind of traveling quite uh, quite far. Or of course on airplanes you have a wing tip vortex. All of them, all of these vortices can to some extent be approximated by, by a Rankine vortex which then has this pressure dis distribution and this type of velocity distribution. Okay, now I would like to, um, uh, to, 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 to close uh, this um, discussion about uh, about vortices with one question um, and I have it here so I have another poll uh, it's very it's a very easy one so we have now talked about the, the pressure and how the pressure changes in a vortex now what I would like to know from you is why do we have the lower pressure in the center I mean now we calculated it we we know that we have low pressure in the center, but why do we have the lower pressure? Is it because of the Bernoulli equ Bernoulli's equation? Is it because of the centripetal force? Is it because of the uh, viscosity? Or is it because of the vortex stretching? So we know that the pressure is lowest in the center, but why is it like that? Bernoulli, centripetal force, viscosity, vortex stretching. What is the reason for this behavior? That could be kind of an exam question. Kind of, that's a typical exam, exam question. Because it's a very, it's a very easy question, easy to formulate. And one can discuss a lot about it. Okay, now I got the 22 answers. And actually, it turns out it's not so clear. There is, um, there is 18% uh, that say it's Bernoulli, 50% centripetal force, 4% viscosity, and 25% vortex stretching. Let's discuss this briefly. So um, let's start, well, okay. Um, the question was why lowest pressure, oops, you cannot read. Uh, why we have the lowest pressure in the center? Well, okay, we had, um, we had a, a few answers. Let's start with vortex stretching. Why can it be, why is it not vortex stretching? Can anybody tell me why it's not vortex stretching? Any suggestion? It's a very simple answer why it's not vortex stretching. 
It's because we are considering a 2D flow. Exactly. No, we have a 2D flow. There is no vortex stretching in 2D flows. So there is a simply no vortex stretching present. So it cannot be vortex stretching. Second answer, um, viscosity. Could it be due to viscosity that we have um, the lowest pressure in the center? Again, a very simple answer. Can anybody tell me? Remember the equation that we started with? Because because we deal with the Euler equations. Yeah. Or or rather, we can we can do it with the Euler equations as well. So that means no independent of viscosity. Okay, then we had another answer, which was Bernoulli. So that is a kind of a classical um, uh, question. So if you, if you think of a vortex, um, your velocity profile, you know, if you, if you draw as a function of R, you have the velocity which increases first and then kind of um, goes down like this, right? This is, this is the velocity. Now, Bernoulli says, if the, if the velocity goes up, the pressure goes down, right? I mean, the sum of the velocity squared and the pressure should be constant. Um, okay, that would of course mean that in the in the inner part, of course, it's it's not so clear because um, you know the velocity goes up, so that would actually mean that the pressure would go down. But but here you could argue, okay, the velocity goes down, so that means that the, that the pressure goes uh, goes goes up towards the outside, so the pressure is lowest in the center. What is wrong with this? Um, with this um, statement. Why can't we use Bernoulli? Bernoulli is only valid along streamlines. Here, we have concentric streamlines. Uh, and the problem is Bernoulli is only valid along streamlines because the constant, so the sum between the, the static and the dynamic pressure is only constant along streamlines. Between different streamlines, you, you would have different constants, right? So the, the answer is no, Bernoulli is only along only along streamlines. That is not the case. Okay, so what is the answer? Well, the, fir the, the fourth, um, option was the centripetal acceleration. Well, if you now go back uh, to to our uh, to to the way that we uh, calculated it, well, it's essentially what we have seen here is that in the radial direction we have a balance between this term, so u squared divided by r, and um, where do we have it? And this term, the pressure gradient in R. And then if we if we integrate this, well, we get exactly this, this behavior. So P is a function of R squared first, and then further away, it's a function of R, R to the minus two. So that means the term that makes the, the, the pressure first, first go up quadratically and then go down quadratically, so with minus, uh, minus two, that is, of course, the centripetal force. So the centripetal acceleration. So the fact that we are actually on a circular streamline, so there needs to be a force that presses the flow in to stay on, um, uh, to, to stay on, on, on a circular stream. Or rather, we, we should maybe say it in, in, a, in a different way. So we have actually a centrifugal acceleration that, that kind of, that does this so that the pressure is is in the end then lowest in the pressure uh, in the, in the in the vortex center. So the right answer to this question is we have a centripetal acceleration. This is the reason why the vortex that the pressure is the lowest in the center. 
Okay. Um, yeah, so this was the second, uh, so this was now my last example about uh, the concentric streamlines. So remember we had, uh, we had examples with unidirectional flow, we had examples with concentric streamlines, and now as the last part of this exact solutions, I would like to look at um, something that is called parallel axisymmetric flows. So we would like to look at a flow that is again unidirectional in the sense that it only goes into one direction, so it's a parallel flow. But in addition to what we discussed earlier about unidirectional flows, where the shape of the geometry could be anything, remember the duct flow or the star-shaped flow. In this case, I would also like to um, um, to to um, uh, to restrict it further, saying that we're talking about flows that need to be axisymmetric. So, per definition, there is no dependence on theta of our velocity p. So, if you now kind of write that down, so we have um, uh, u r, we have u theta, and we have um, u set components. Again, I mean we're we're doing that in a in a polar coordinate system, so we're, where we have an x in the in the and the y direction, and then we have kind of a, a theta and then an r uh, direction. Um, and of course, that if that defines me, then my u r, my u theta, and my u set. Now, if I'm talking about parallel axisymmetric flows. Um, that of course directly tells me, okay, u r and u theta needs to be zero, and u z can only, I mean, if if we now write down all the dependencies that we can that we can have, it can only be a function of r, but not of theta because it's axisymmetric, and of course t we can take away because it's steady. So that means um, at the at the end, my flow. Um, is only in one direction, and the, the u z is only a function of r and potentially z. And as I said, this is this is due to axi symmetry and steady steadiness. So, what are parallel axisymmetric flows? Well, I guess the, the main example or the main, the main flow that is actually parallel and axisymmetric, um, we can essentially say that this is, this looks like pipe flows, but it doesn't actually need to be pipe flows. It, it doesn't need to have a wall. Uh, it could also be jet flows, round jets, but kind of the, the main example would be a pipe flow where, where the idea is you have a, you know, a pipe that kind of looks like looks like this, and um, uh, so so I mean this this direction could then be the set direction, and you know you have a parallel flow so that goes like this so everything goes into the set direction, and um, of course the geometry is uh, fully axisymmetric. So this would be one example of a. Um, of a parallel axisymmetric flow, but but I mean chats and so on would also be possible. But let's now try to calculate a little bit and see what the conditions are that a parallel axisymmetric flow needs to um, needs to fulfill. We start as usual with the continuity equation in cylindrical coordinates, of course. Um, so that means our nabla u. Uh, being zero would then become again keeping in mind that we're now doing nabla applied on a vector, so that means we also need to do the need to do the derivatives of the um, um, of the of the unit vectors. So that means we get at the end du dur dr plus one divided by r times du theta d theta plus du z d z plus u 
R divided by R. And this needs to be, um, needs to be zero. Now, with all my simplifications that I have um, up here, so of course, that means that this term is zero, this term is zero, um, this term is zero. Uh, so what remains is just um, du set d set is zero. And that means that u set is actually only a function of r, not of z anymore. So that means um, here we can. Uh, we can essentially write that that this functionality, uh, this this dependence, is also zero because of the continuity. So. <clears throat> okay. Of course, this is already much simpler, and of course, it resembles uh, some of the simplifications that we had uh, done also for the um, for the unidirectional flow. I mean, that's that's actually yeah, it's it's kind of the same. Okay, so this was the the continuity equation. Now, of course, we can we can go on and and, and look at um, at some of the the components of the momentum equation. Um, typically, the one component that is most interesting would be the Z momentum equation. So the um, uh, the momentum equation, the axial uh, direction. So that means I, I project the momentum equations on the on the set direction, and also here uh, we should of course formulate that in cylindrical coordinates. So all the the, the Nabla operators are in in cylindrical coordinates. Um, I just write the result, um, and of course um, it would be very nice if you could uh, verify that. But we have u r times d u z d r uh, plus u theta divided by r. Um, times uh, du z d theta, and then we have u z du z d z, and this should be the same as minus one over rho, and then we have the axial uh, pressure direction uh, pressure gradient one over rho times dp d z plus the corresponding um, viscous term. Uh, uh, nu times nabla squared, u z. So, of course, it's the momentum equation. So that means we have a balance on two sides where we have the acceleration, as usual, which is the same as uh, the forces. So that's that's kind of the typical uh, the typical way. Well, but now let's look at which terms actually survive. Well, with all our um, with our all our uh, limitations and restrictions that we introduced here, we can see that the first term uh, goes away, the second term goes away, the third term goes away, which essentially means that all acceleration terms um, are actually gone away, which means that actually it's not a balance between acceleration and force because there is actually no acceleration. So in the end, what it becomes or what the momentum equation does here is that it's just an internal balance between the forces that are acting. So it's a balance between the pressure force in the set direction and the viscous forces. So what we get is a balance um, between um, viscous term and the axial pressure the axial pressure gradient. Uh, I mean there's also I mean, now we have seen that there is no axial acceleration that is possible, but uh, I mean, you can also think of this physically. Um, why is there no axial uh, acceleration actually possible? Why can't the flow increase in speed in the axial direction? Well, that would essentially mean that 
you would need to, because it's accelerating, you would need to feed inflow from the, uh, from the outside. And um, this, of course, um, uh, would, would then violate some of, the, some of the conditions that we had um, higher up. So that means um, we can say that no, no axial um, acceleration, acceleration uh, possible. Um, because such an acceleration, so because this would uh, lead to what is called entrainment. Um, so essentially sucking in, sucking in fluid from the outside. And of course, the sucking in uh, fluids from the outside is not possible if we talk about the parallel axisymmetric flow. So a unidirectional flow, of course, doesn't allow sucking in fluids from the, from the outside. Okay, so in the end, we're, what we need to solve here is the balance between the axial press, pressure gradient and the viscous, uh, the viscous term. So in order to, to, to do that or to, to write up this balance, it's maybe good now to, to, to actually, well, maybe do it like this to, to make it clear. So we say that this is term number one. So this is term number one. So we just write it out what, what it is. So nabla squared u z, uh, again in, in cylindrical coordinates. Um, so this is one divided by r, d d r of, R times U Z divided by D, D U Z divided by D U R plus one over R squared times D squared U Z um, D theta squared plus D squared U Z D Z squared. Now, of course, also here, many terms are zero. Actually, this one is zero because dd, dd theta is uh, zero, and this one is zero because dd z is zero. So that means at the very end, uh, what, is, what is remaining as this force balance that, that I have is actually very simple. So the remaining force balance is simply um, d dr of r times d u z dr. So that's that's the term from the viscous term, um, which should be the same as r divided by mu times d p d z. So uh, a few things to 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 recognize here. So I went from nu to mu because I took away the density or I divided by the density. So that, that goes from mu to nu. Um, and I also rewrote the, the I rewrote the, um, the derivatives for the pressure into a uh, ordinary differential uh, or an ordinary diff derivative, because I know from before, when we looked at these types of flows, that there is actually no I mean, the pressure is independent of the of the radius, uh, so which we could see from the other momentum equations in the radial direction, um, because there is no force, so that, that there is no there is no change in pressure possible in that direction. So therefore, the pressure I know is only or may only be a function of z. So that that means uh, I can write ordinary um, differentials for for the pressure. Yeah. So this is the the only remaining terms from the momentum equations. Well, now you see that this is, um, there's two derivatives for u z. So it's a second derivative in the end. So that means if I want to get now the velocity profile, I would need to integrate twice. And uh, I can do that. If I do a first integral, you can see that this is quite uh, straightforward. Then I have an r inside, I do the second, uh, second integration. And then of course I will get the result. 
Um, I'll not write it down here. Um, I'll just uh, write the, the, the result. So integrate. Integrate twice. And what we get um, is u set of r uh, then becomes dp d set times r squared divided by 4 mu plus a times ln of r, so one logarithm here, plus b. Of course, we get two. We get two integration constants because we integrate it twice, so that that certainly makes um, makes sense. And now we have a logarithmic term and we have a uh, constant. And this here would now be the general solution for uh, these parallel axisymmetric flows without boundary conditions. So I have not implemented any boundary conditions. Um, I just assumed that, or, you know, based on the title, I just assumed that the flow is axisymmetric and parallel. Nothing, nothing more than that. Now, yeah. So this is this is the general solution. If I now want to um, do that for pipe flow, if I if I really want to go into the, uh, I want to calculate the solution for a pipe like this, where I can say that the, the diameter would be two times a, so the radius would be a. So pipe with a radius of a. Well, I can then have boundary conditions. Well, I need two boundary conditions. One of them obviously is the boundary conditions at the wall, which is the no slip boundary conditions, which says that u set at r being a should be zero. So that's no slip boundary condition. Um, but then I also need to have some boundary condition at the center. So r being zero. And I don't really know what the flow at r being zero is. But I know it cannot go to infinity. So it needs to be some sort of, you know, regular uh, solution, or I can, I can say a non-divergent solution in the, in the center. And actually, um, if we look at this general solution here, we can realize why this is important, because if we just put r being zero in here, the first term is no problem, the last term is no problem. But the term with the a, so a times ln of r, of course, that becomes a problem because the ln of r is actually infinity. So this requirement of having a non-divergent solution directly means that a is in fact zero. This a may not need may not be zero if, for instance, I'm looking at a at, a, at an annulus, so a pipe without the center. Um, but but if I have a uh, if I have a center, then of course this means a is zero. With the first condition, with the no slip boundary condition, I can then calculate um, what b becomes. And actually, I'm not doing it here, and I'm again inviting you to just do that at home. Um, but if you now calculate what b is, and then you write down the solution, you actually get u set as a function of r for a pi, um, which is then minus dp d set times a squared divided by four mu. And in the bracket, we have one minus r divided by a to the power of two. And this here is now the velocity profile in a circular pipe. And as we, saw, uh, we discussed that before, this is the hagen poiseuille profile or the hagen poiseuille flow of a circular or a circular pipe flow. 
And of course, this we can now compare to the channel flow that we derived, um, I don't know, three, four, five hours ago. Um, and we can, of course, identify a, a number of uh, terms here. So the first, the first bit, so in, in, in front of the edgy brackets, that would be the center line velocity, UCL. Center line velocity. And the second bit here, one minus R squared, this would then be a, a parabola. So there is actually a parabolic shape of, of this, as in the channel flow. And I guess the main difference to the channel flow is just the value of this UCL as this relates to the bulk velocity, which we'll talk in a second about. But, but this, uh, this now is the exact solution for um, circular pipe flow, derived from the Navier-Stokes equations. Okay. So now we have used the continuity equation, the set momentum equations. Let's uh, just try a few more things uh, to, which we can now calculate. We can look at the vorticity in this uh, flow case. Well, the vorticity omega is nabla cross u. Uh, now, how, how big is the vorticity in this case? Well, of course, it's, um, it's uh, a cylindrical coordinate, so we need to be a bit careful how the nabla operator is formulated. Again, this is not exactly fluid mechanics, but of course, still important for us to know. I'll just write it down. So the nabla operator would now be, or the, 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 the vorticity now would be one over R, you said the uh, theta minus du theta d set. That's the first component in the ER direction. Then we have uh, dur d set minus du set dr. That's in the E theta direction. And then we have one over R of dr u theta dr minus du r theta in the E set direction. Most of these terms, of course, are zero. Uh, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero, and this is zero, and this is zero. So essentially what is left is just one term, namely omega in the theta direction, which is minus d u z divided by d r. And if I plug in now the velocity profile that I have derived here, I actually get a very simple result dp dz times r divided by two mu. So this is my this is my vorticity that I have. So that means the vorticity is, is independent of, of um, is independent of of uh, uh, of, of uh, theta. It's independent of z. So the only thing that comes in is the pressure gradient, but this is just a number. So that means in the end, what I have, I have vorticity sheets, you know, kind of, you know, round, round sheets, which, uh, which go through, through my pipe. So as a function of R, it changes, but everything else is, is constant. So I will have, I know I, I can try to, I can, I can try to, to sketch it. It would be kind of something, you know, this here would be now one vorticity uh, sheet. Or T sheets, um, which are constant in the streamwise direction set. Okay, so this was the vorticity. Then I can also calculate the center line velocity as we have um, done before. Or actually, which is just written, which is just written here, which is minus dp dz times a squared divided by four mu. Okay. 
And I can calculate the bulk velocity UV, which is just the integral of the velocity, um, which is one over pi a squared times the integral from zero to two pi, from zero to a of UCL times one minus r divided by a squared r <coughs> d, d phi dr. And so this is just the, the, the integral of the velocity profile. And if I do that, what I will get at the end is UCL divided by two. And this is the bulk velocity. And of course, this is interesting. Uh, the result here is UCL divided by two for U bulk. And uh, if you remember back, um, this is actually what we discussed when we talked about the channel. And there it was two thirds and not one half. Or uh, actually it was, um, it was three halves uh, instead of, um, of a factor of two or two thirds uh, as opposed to a factor of one half. So that means in the pipe, so in the, in the round geometry of the pipe, the central line velocity is twice as large as the bulk velocity in a channel, which is planar, the central line velocity is only one and a half times the bulk velocity. And of course, the reason for that is the shape of the pipe where there is actually much less, if you, if you think of it, the area of the center is much lower. So that means there's much less area um, related to the high speed fluid. That's why the high speed fluid in the center needs to be of a higher velocity than as compared to, to a channel flow. Okay, so this was the bulk velocity. And um, well, of course, now we can kind of continue with, with a, a number of different, different quantities related to pipe flow. We can look at Q, which is the flow rate. Flow rate is just U, UB times the, the area. So UB times pi A squared. So that would be the flow rate. We can look at the skin friction coefficient. Of course, that's, um, that's, that's interesting. That's tau the absolute value of tau wall divided by one, one half rho UB squared. So if I, if I normalize it with the bulk velocity, um, that will give, me, will, will give me four times UB times mu divided by, by the radius A times two divided by rho UB squared. That's the normalization. And of course, now the interesting thing is, um, if I combine everything, so I have mu and, and rho, this will become a nu. Then I have an, an a here, which I can express as a diameter. Um, and then I have ub divided by ub squared, which is of course one over ub. So that means I can now set this equal to um, a factor, which is 16 divided by a Reynolds number, um, based on the diameter D. So with Reynolds D being defined as rho times U, UB times the diameter D divided by mu. Now, of course, you can wonder why I'm, why I'm normalizing it with the diameter, because in channel, for instance, I took the channel half width. Um, I cannot tell you why this is done in this way, but this is just the convention for defining uh, the Reynolds number in pipes. So if you talk about the Reynolds number in a pipe flow, if you say, I have a pipe with a Reynolds of 2000, I mean the Reynolds number based on the bulk velocity and the diameter. So this is uh, based on bulk velocity, so the UB, and the diameter, D. Again, there's no reason why it should be like that. It's just a convention that we, 
that we just um, do it in that way. Okay, um, I guess this is uh, this is it. What I wanted to tell you about pipe flow. Um, after the break, I have one more example with um, pipe flows, which I would like to do, and then and then we can leave the topic of these exact solutions. Or actually, we continue with exact solutions, but we can leave kind of the general topic of general. Gen uh, uh, exact solutions, and we go into a boundary layer problems. So that means um, for now, I would like to, to have another break of 15 minutes. So let's stop the recording.